Okay, everybody. Yep. Oh, there we have the uh, deputy gavel there. Okay. If I could just reconvene the meeting. We were on questions of staff, and Councillor Malik had the floor. Do you have additional questions? I do. I thought you might. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I don't mean to belabor the point on the environmental assessment, but may maybe I do. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the reason that the province has given the city for not conducting an environmental assessment for the West Island related to the lake fill work? Uh, through the chair, uh, what, what the, one of the deputants, Ross Burnett from IO, really spoke to that, and I, I really don't think it's appropriate for us to comment further on on uh, what he, what he said. Um, so, in staff's view, is an environmental assessment for this application as it relates to Lake Phil on the West Island required under the official plan and the waterfront secondary plan? I mean, from our perspective, what would be the preference? Through the chair, it is a, an environmental system and is a requirement through the official plan and the central waterfront secondary plan. And I guess from the staff report, what I guess I read was that, and was uh, I guess reflected back from the deputant is that while there are aspects of an environmental assessment, it is not an environmental assessment. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Um, does the city's planning policies for the waterfront include reducing transportation by car use? Through the chair, that is correct. Uh, both the central waterfront secondary plan and the parent document, the official plan, emphasize uh, non-auto use and a redirection to pedestrian cycling transit and uh, in the case of uh, Ontario Place, uh, water transit as well. Uh, thank you very much. And can you tell us a little bit more about what transit improvements are planned for the area around Ontario Place over the next several years? Yes, through the chair. Uh, there are a number of improvements planned uh, at ex Exhibition Place. Uh, first, the uh, improvements to the GO station at Exhibition Place, uh, increased service on the GO line uh, that goes through Exhibition Place, the addition of the Ontario Line Station, the end, end station point, uh, at that same location. Uh, there are also plans to extend the LRT, which ends now at the Exhibition Loop, and expand that, expand that over to uh, Dufferin Street. Um, and those are the key uh, transit improvements. Um, that's, that's pretty significant to hear, so thank you for sharing that. Um, does the proposal for 2,700 potentially plus total underground and surface parking spaces meet the policy objectives for transportation use on our waterfront? Uh, through the chair, we find that number uh, excessive. It's quite a bit above the uh, bylaw requirement for parking, and it does not satisfy those uh, policy directions. Um, related to that, how does this um, proposal measure up against the city's climate action goals? Uh, through the chair. Uh, the city's objectives on climate change include reducing carbon emissions and carbon neutral new development. Uh, the Thermae proposal for the West Island is an all glass building, uh, which is a structure that will make it difficult to create a highly energy efficient structure uh, that reduces, re reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the proposal for the parking structure um, does not assess the impact on upfront carbon emissions, embodied carbon, uh, associated with the impacts of material and construction. 
Below grade parking structures have been shown to have a disproportionate impact uh, on carbon emissions, which would be further exacerbated uh, where subsurface water measures are needed. Uh, the parking strategy does, does also not support the shift uh, to more sustainable lower uh, emission modes of transportation. Um, staff are encouraging uh, the applicant to go above the minimum requirements for the Toronto Green Standards and achieve uh, higher performance measures of Tier 2 or Tier 3 uh, to address the city's net zero uh, targets. Thank you very much. Um, and we got a sense of um, some of the public engagement and that's very important to this process that is coming up, the in-person uh, consultation um, this Saturday and then a virtual one on, on April 18th. Um, can you uh, lay out for us a bit of what the city's plans for public engagement are on this redevelopment proposal um, alongside uh, what, uh, what has been publicly shared in this first round? Through the chair, in addition to our event on Saturday and the virtual event on the 18th, we're, con we're considering a follow-up event in, 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 ad in advance of the resubmission that we're expecting in late June uh, to review design changes and, and uh, review with the applicant some of the things they've been hearing from stakeholders. So that, that's also contingent on the outcomes of what happens uh, over the next couple um, consultation events. So that's what we're planning for. Thank you very much. That's it for now. Do any other members have questions, staff? Councillor Moyes. Uh, thank you, and I'll be quick. Um, I know a lot of the deputants mentioned that this is, this is their first time here deputing here at uh, council or at committee, and perhaps um, staff can probably explain what this report is. It says this is a status report and what actions uh, councillors are expected to take here this evening. Uh, through the chair. So the, uh, this is a status report. It sort of takes almost the role that you would have expected previously. We would have uh, made through a preliminary report. So this is basically an initial assessment of staff's response uh, to the proposal, uh, outlining uh, where we're at and next steps in terms of the review. With regards to the recommendation, the recommendation is simply that the report be received by Community Council for information. Can you explain to the deputy and to the chair what receipt and uh, approval means? Uh, through the chair, the, uh, basically it's, the report is basically for information um, for community council and for the public. As I noted, just outlining the, uh, the status of the application and the status of a review uh, thus far at an early stage in the process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? I'm sure we could go all night, but you know, you guys have got to keep thinking, right? So we'll pass on that. Okay. Um, so we'll uh, move to speaking. I'll begin with Councillor Malik. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I do have a motion, um, and I guess staff can put it on the screen. Um, and it recommends that Toronto and East York Community Council request the Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to continue to use the following guiding principles for the revitalization of Ontario Place based on the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan and read and interpret it in the context of the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan in the review of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications for the Ontario Place redevelopment. Um, in the answers that we heard from staff uh, on the principles, their development, and their important guidance, I'll just um, highlight some of the, the big ones, removing barriers and making connections, promoting a green, uh, clean and green environment, uh, creating uh, dynamic and diverse new communities, and openness and transparency. Um, and the rest of the uh, motion is on the screen. And I want to thank staff from City Planning, the Waterfront Secretariat, and all divisions for their work on this important report. I want to thank everyone for their patience and speaking to the committee, for everyone who has written in um, in response to this report. And I was so heartened, as uh, Councillor Moyes um, raised, to hear so that so many people were here for the first time, energized and motivated um, to, to do better for our waterfront um, and showing up here and speaking to community council. So thank you for that. 
Um, this uh, update is a key step in the city's commitment to leading a robust, transparent public process on the review of the future of Ontario Place. And it is regrettable and frankly what we heard unacceptable that decisions on such an important public space began with such an incredible lack of transparency by a provincial government that announced its plans with closed door decisions and no sufficient prior consultation with the public or the City of Toronto on a vision for how this space could be revitalized. We know good process matters and meaningful consultation with Indigenous communities, Toronto residents and people from across Ontario will and can create better outcomes. Decisions made through a public process with transparency create confidence for the long haul for future generations that we've also referenced so much today. The City of Toronto has consistently advocated for a strong partnership with the provincial government when it comes to the future of Ontario Place, one that is rooted in openness and transparency. And when the province first announced its plans, the city took a few powerful and important steps that we heard more about today. It created a subcommittee and called public meetings to establish these guiding principles for the revitalization of Ontario Place endorsed by Council for any redevelopment. That proactive, collective visioning for the future of an important public space is essential to good planning and we're demonstrating that here. Thanks to the expertise and dedication of our city staff, we now have clearer answers about the proposal that has been put forward. It isn't an acceptable development for Ontario Place and right now does not belong on our waterfront. It has failed to show it fits into the carefully planned green space and heritage landscape, internationally recognized under threat by the World Monument Fund. It has chosen to ignore the transit improvements plan for the area and instead push people into cars with 2,700 parking space structures um, built with, with hundreds of millions of public dollars. In doing so, it also fails to meet our climate leadership goals as a city. It is also very concerning to me that the province has not followed its own rules by denying a proper environmental assessment for the West Island. There are no shortcuts for the revitalization of important public land to be done in the public interest. And today, residents and community stakeholders were able to advance the public conversation on this proposal through comments to, city, to the city staff report. The public engagement will continue this week, as we have mentioned, with the first city-led meeting on the application this Saturday, April 15th, in person at the Beanfield Centre in a virtual meeting on Tuesday, April 18th. I'm looking forward to this open and robust engagement on what the future of Ontario Place should be. I know our city staff will listen actively in these coming days, weeks and months as the development process continues. This public engagement is critical in the future of Ontario Place. The province needs to listen to Ont uh, Torontonians and we've, we urge them again as we have uh, for, the, for many times before to actively engage with residents in this process. Finally, Ontario Place revitalization must continue to be led by clear principles based on public policy and public interests. And that is why I'm asking this community council to reaffirm the guiding principles that were approved through a genuine public and transparent process in the previous terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions of the mover? I'll allow the applause <laughs> this time. Councillor Sachs has a question. Councillor Sachs, you had a question. Not a question. I, I just I wanted to speak for a minute. Okay. I, I'd seen Councillor Moyce next, and then I'll come to you after him. Councillor Moyce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to take some time just to thank the deputants for you know being here. You know you've been here since nine thirty in the morning, and it's now nine thirty at night. You know, as you probably saw, I've been struggling with my allergies today, but I, I'm here. <laughs> but I uh, also want to, uh, yeah, so thanks to all of you, and also, too, I've received many emails from uh, people from across the city, you know, advocating for, for our Ontario place. And also, too, I've met with Norm De Pasquale and his team, you know, just giving me uh, feedback on what's happening and, 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 and the proposals and, and their thoughts on the project. I also want to thank uh, Councillor Malik for her leadership on this file as well. You know, since she's taken office in the last four and a half months, five months, she's really dug right in and you know, uh, really advocated for our community here in Toronto. And of course, to thank staff as well for all their hard work. You know, I, I grew up in the city. You know, I immigrated to Canada at the age of seven. One of the first places that my family took me was to Ontario Place. 
when I was in elementary school, I went to the Sinus Fair, and, you know, watch the stars and learned about the stars for the first time. And that's why I f fell in love with, you know, astrology and all those things. Astronomy, I should say, whatever it is called now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I do have fond memories of Ontario Place. And, you know, it's a place that uh, we all have fond memories of, listening to the deputants all day today. You know, it made me sort of reminisce about my own experiences. And that's what it's supposed to, de to, to do and, and to continue to be for younger kids uh, growing up here in our city. So um, again, it is a jewel and we should protect it and we should do all that we can to do that. And this is just the first step of many. And uh, I will continue to support uh, you and uh, Council Malik and, and as we go forward. So thanks again, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sachs. Yes, I wanted to say thank you to the staff uh, and to all the deputants for your passionate words and speaking up for this issue and to pledge my support for doing everything we possibly can to prevent the privatization of Ontario Place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bravo. Thank you, Chair. I, I want to support the leadership of Councillor Malik. As Councillor Moist said, she's been working so hard on this file, and i got to tell you, we're behind you. Thank you to staff. You know, there's an obligation of government to invest, and investing in Ontario Place is something that the provincial government neglected, uh, I think, in a very purposeful way for a really long time. Um, and this is just an... an Another example of how the people of Toronto are shortchanged by the provincial government in so many different ways. The thing that has to guide us here is public good, equity, the notion of what land is actually for. Public land has to have a purpose that's social, that lifts us all up economically, yes, and, and socially in terms of our goals that we've set out together. City Council, I think, has to use every single tool at our disposal, every single uh, tool of municipal government um, as leverage to uphold the principles that have been set out for a better vision for Ontario Place. But I, I want to just recognize that it's you, all of you, the deputants, the organizing, working on the, with your inside champions within government. That's the power that we need to get a better outcome here. So I hope that this is just a start, and I really want to thank you and recognize you for all of your efforts. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of quick things, too. Um, I've been sitting here during this discussion and thinking about the nature of politics. Sitting on you know this side around this table, politics becomes this procedural thing, this this rule-bound thing, this uh, place where we try to referee interests and come to decisions based on an established bodies of law. And, you know, that's of some value. But there's also the, the politics out in the world where people are organizing, where people are struggling to make a better Toronto and make a better place. And then there's the moment when these two worlds come together. Uh, a moment like this evening, and there have been other ones here, and this is what I love about local government, is we can actually create that third space. Uh, it's a space of imagination, it's a space of memory, it's a space of hope, and it's a space where we create uh, power and fight back against really, really bad problems in our society like this one. So uh, I want to thank everyone who's uh, shared this conversation from all sides, the members of the committee, the members of the public service, the clerks who have been somehow managing to keep me on track, but mostly all of you who've uh, taken time out of what are doubtlessly very busy lives with a lot of demands to come and create this third space together with us tonight. Thank you. The work will continue, and we will win. Okay. Um, so before we get to the voting, I have to make a ruling. If I could have the motion that Councillor Matlow left up on the screen. So Councillor Matlow, who wanted to be here and couldn't, uh, left a motion with the clerks. 
I'm just going to put it out and read it out. Put it up and read it out. City Council directs city staff not to engage in discussions or negotiations with representatives from the province of Ontario regarding the sale or exchange of the 16 acres of city-owned land and water at Ontario Place. Now, golly, that's a lot of fun, but um, it I'm going to have to rule it out of order for two reasons. Uh, the first being... Uh, the specific task we have in front of us today is to consider the update on the planning process. There's a separate process uh, through another committee to deal with the uh, land exchange, and so that rightfully belongs over there. And also, uh, this would be outside the jurisdiction and reach of the Toronto East York Community Council to direct staff on that item. So I'm going to have to rule that out of order, as much fun as it Okay, all right, um, so what I'm going to propose is that we take Councillor Malik's amendment uh, and uh, also I would like to record this vote. So if I can have all members uh, raise their hands if they are in favor of Councillor Malik's motion. We've got Councillor Bravo, Councillor Perks, Councillor Sachs, Councillor Moyes and Councillor Malik, that is unanimous. Okay, thank you all very much for being here. And for everyone else who's here, but wait, there's more. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the next item of a business on our agenda is item TE 4.37, the status report on the Gerard Carlaw North Transit Oriented Community. If I, guys, I'm, I'm just going to ask you, hello, hello. I know you all are, have a lot to talk about, but can I ask you to take the conversations outside the room? Okay? Thank you. Uh, let me just see. Do I have deputations on item 37? Is that what you're here for? Mr. Richardson, you're a very patient and or stubborn man. Uh, yeah. You have five minutes to address the committee. The floor is yours. Thank you, councillors. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, councillors are Housing Now TO Civic Tech volunteers, many of whom live in the wards near the Gerard Carlaw Transit Oriented Community Site, attended the fall 2022 public meetings and the spring 2023 public meetings with City Planning, Infrastructure Ontario, Metrolinks, Choice REIT, which is Loblaws and Weston. Our volunteers, along with other community members, have also reviewed all of the available documents, including the, the map I'm showing you here, uh, available on the Infrastructure Ontario website. As detailed in the staff report on this item, this is a large 5.61 acre commercial site connected to the new planned Girard Station on the Ontario line. Based on the earlier Ontario line transit-oriented communities, our volunteers anticipate the, prov the province will be issuing a minister's zoning order for the Gerard Carlaw North transit-oriented community within the next six months. Toronto Council cannot wait for a new mayor to be elected before developing an agreement with our federal and provincial governments and to lock in a repeatable model for delivering dedicated units of new affordable rental housing on all of these transit-oriented community sites south of Bloor and forth. To date, To date, there are anticipated to be 8,167 total units of new residential on these transit-oriented sites south of Bloor Danforth along the Ontario line. Of the approximately 8,100 new residential units that are included in these provincial transit-oriented community sites between Exhibition Station and Girard Station, the only specific public agreement for the delivery of new affordable housing units is 215 units uh, at the Ontario uh, Lion Station at East Harbour, and that was a negotiation with the Ontario Teachers' Pension Fund. That number represents just 2.6% of the total new units that our provincial government anticipates creating at their TOC sites along the southern portion of the Ontario line. In comparison,
The city of Toronto on the Ontario line has a housing now site at Don Mills Crossing, at Don Mills and Eglinton. On one site alone, on the two parking lots at Don Mills and Eglinton, on the, uh, on the one side, 770 Don Mills is a 5.5 acre commercial site, very similar dimensions uh, to the Gerard Carlock Transit Oriented Community site. But on the Don Mills site, City Council has already approved Create TO's plan for a three tower development with a total of 1,252 new residential units. And you have locked in a requirement for one third of the new housing, 417 units to be offered as a affordable rental. On the Gerard, Transit, uh, Gerard Carlock Transit Oriented Community site, Torontonians should ask the same questions that our volunteers have asked on all of these TOC MZO developments. How quickly can the city work with our provincial and federal governments to deliver an agreement in 2023 to ensure a substantial quantity of new affordable rental units on all of these transit oriented community sites? How can the city work with pension funds and landowners like Choice REIT to ensure that their transit oriented redevelopment projects provide affordable rental units that would be available in the future to junior employees within their own organizations? How many grocery workers will be able to live in this site in the future? How many people who work in the junior ranks of the Choice REIT will be able to live in this site in the future? Um, we would like to uh, ensure that those questions are asked by Council uh, when we're looking at this site at Gerard and Carla. And as always, our open data and civic tech volunteers are happy to answer any questions that the committee may have about affordable housing development best practices and how to make the best use of transit oriented lands here in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the deputy? Mark, we admire your persistence. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to make a deputation on this item? Seeing none, are there any questions of staff? No? Councillor Bravo, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Chair. On behalf of Councillor Fletcher, who can't be here, I'd like to um, uh, move a motion. Have an amendment. I do not. I. It's with the clerk, so I do. Wouldn't you know? We're having screen problems. There we go. Okay. So there's the motion. Take a moment. Da, da, da. All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. That mar the motion is about uh, requiring affordable housing. Very good. Any questions of the mover? Does anyone else wish to speak? Okay, we'll take it all as a package. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, I'm going to try to get the ones with deputants wound up first. So we'll go next to TE 4.66. I don't know what that was. Was that the inside of my brain? Okay. Um, pedestrian safety on Avenue Road, Bloor Street to St. Clair Avenue West. We have deputants, Barbara Kapchin. No? Barbara, no? Okay. Um, Albert Cole. I don't see Albert in the room. Albert's online. Albert, are you with us? I feel like I'm sending like notes out yeah. for submarine. Ah, there's Albert. Can you hear me? Yes, Albert. Yeah. You're 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 live and well. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll keep it uh, very short. I'm I'm a member of the Avenue Road uh, Safety Coalition, our group uh, came together uh, six years ago. We were united in a very simple, brief uh, demand, which was to get 
lower speeds on Avenue Road and a wider sidewalk. So we're back again, as we've been advocating for the last six years with this uh, very simple uh, and concise uh, demand for lower speeds and for a wider sidewalk. So we support the uh, motion by Councillor Sachs uh, to uh, do a pilot a wider sidewalk. I uh, believe it's high time to do that, and we urge you to approve this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Are there any questions? Nope, seeing none. Uh, Brother Dominic Vigiani. Is he online? We're just seeing if he's online. Nope, okay. Uh, not in the room. Okay, we'll move to the next person, Kathy McDonald. Kathy, you've been with us all day. I have. Hey, there yes, you are. Yes, this is my, my last last item for the day, and uh, I really appreciate all the work all, all of, um, the councillors have been doing and all the deputants through the day. So um, uh, for this item, I'm uh, representing the Deer Park uh, Residents Group. I'm their current president. So we're um, members of the uh, Avenue Road Safety Co uh, Coalition. Avenue Road is our western boundary. So um, uh, we drive along Avenue Road a lot and um, walk along the far too narrow sidewalks and the uh, our children go to school along those uh, sidewalks. Um, so we've been um, you know, supporting um, uh, decreasing speeds and widening sidewalks and um, um, definitely support um, the motions of um, our councillor, Matt Lowe and councillor Sachs to um, actually do something about this fast. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Kathy? No, thank you very much for hanging in with us all day. It's been a slice. Um, Dylan Reed. Dylan? I know you're out there in the ether somewhere. Dylan? Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, okay, yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so my name is Dylan Reed. Uh, I'm here representing Walk Toronto. Uh, Walk Toronto is a grassroots volunteer organization dedicated to making Toronto a better city for walking. Uh, I lived on Avenue Road for several years in the late 1990s and regularly walk to work and services along the street. And uh, it's depressing that the terrible pedestrian experience on you at that time has not been improved since. Um, the lack of change is even worse given the extensive construction of new residences along the street. Uh, the population living on Avenue Road has increased substantially and will increase even more over the next two decades. Um, if Toronto is to meet the commitments, commitment to encourage three quarters of trips under two kilometers to be accomplished by walking or cycling, it has to make Avenue Road a safe and attractive place for those who to walk for these new residents, as well as for existing residents. In partic it's particularly important given the five schools and four seniors residences on or near the road. Um, the best experience on Avenue Road between Bourne and St. Clair is terrible. In many places, the sidewalk is less than the bare minimum 1.5 meters required for the most basic level of accessibility, um, let alone the 2.1 meters expected for any arterial, arterial road. And even then, the narrow sidewalks are often blocked by utility poles. Meanwhile, the speed of cars driving immediately beside these sidewalks is so threatening and so disturbing that at many points, the city has erected barriers to give pedestrians a feeling of safety although these barriers would be unlikely to make a difference if a speeding car actually crashed into them with a pedestrian present. present. The current width and speed of Avenue Road between Bourne and begin the process of making Avenue Road safe and appealing for pedestrians as well as other users. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dylan? No? Dylan, thank you for hanging in with us. Uh, next, I have Jessica Spiker, or speaker. Jessica? Hi, Jessica, can you hear me?
Jessica? There we go. I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Welcome. You'll have five minutes Great. to address the committee. You can start as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica Speaker, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Friends and Families for Safe Streets to express our wholehearted support for recommendations one, three, four, and five of this motion. Friends and Families for Safe Streets is a group of people whose loved ones were senselessly killed in crashes that could have been prevented, and survivors like me who are devastated by crashes causing severe life-altering injuries, again, all of it preventable. To mark the World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims in 2001, I led a tour of road violence down Avenue Road starting at Roxborough and walking south to Bloor. The amount of violent, devastating crashes along this short one kilometer stretch of Avenue Road was jaw dropping. It was eye opening to walk paying close attention to the crappy conditions on the sidewalk, narrow, hostile, loud, disturbingly close to speeding, potentially distracted, drunk or rage fueled drivers, crosswalks too few and far between. The imbalance between the excessively wide six lanes for cars and the hostile ribbon of sidewalk becomes even more jarring, frustrating, unacceptable, and frankly, callous when you focus on all the instances of road violence that arose out of that very wide six lane design that prioritizes speeding cars over safety. I'll try to give you a very quick summary. In that stretch, there were two high-speed multi-car crashes that actually flung a car off of the roadway. One of them pinned an innocent pedestrian against a building, inflicting severe life-altering injuries, and one flung a car into the gas manifold in front of Hazelton Lane's retirement residence, causing havoc and trauma. Seniors had to be evacuated, a shelter in place, order was issued, the street was entirely closed. But today that gas manifold has several robust concrete bollards in front of it because more consideration was given to the safety of a gas manifold than to the safety of any human being walking, rolling, or riding down Avenue Road. 26-year-old Adam Excel was violently killed by a drunk hit-and-run driver who slammed into him at an estimated 87 kilometers an hour, stopping only to dump his beer before he fled. Three severe injuries were inflicted on people crossing mid-block. Some might want to victim blame these people, but there were no crosswalks between that was within a reasonable distance of where they were crossing. Roadway engineers know that people just won't walk that far to get to a crosswalk, and they know that by design, they're forcing people to cross mid-block. And despite knowing that, they still don't build a crosswalk, and they also face no consequences whatsoever when inevitably users of the road are severely injured or killed. Even so, they, those people weren't in a crosswalk. Other people were severely injured in crosswalks. Two people were struck in crosswalks during green lights by left-turning drivers because there are absolutely no safety measures in place at any intersection on Avenue to prevent that kind of inattentive driving behavior. A young person on a bike was doored in front of the Ferrari dealership, which flung him into a TTC bus. That teenager was likely to survive at all with severe life-altering injuries. And most recently, on August 18th, 2021, a cement truck driver killed 18-year-old Miguel Joshua Escanan as he rode his bike north, leaving the safety of the cycle tracks that are on the south side of Bloor and being thrown to the wolves on the untamed car lanes north of Bloor. That truck driver passed him too closely and Miguel was sucked under the rear wheels of the truck and dragged and crushed to death. What all of that horrific, senseless, devastating road violence inflicted on people outside of cars in this one kilometer stretch has in common is untamed high vehicle speeds, no physical protection between people and car between people who are walking, rolling, and biking, and the car traffic, inadequate crosswalks which are too far apart, hostile narrow sidewalks. What all of that life-shattering violence and horrific human carnage also has in common is that it could have easily been prevented with Vision Zero Road design. So we hope that the coming changes will include important safety measures like raised crosswalks at every intersection, sharp turning radii, curb extensions at all crosswalks, protected intersections where cycling infrastructure intersects, more crosswalks, narrower and fewer lanes for cars, six is way too many, four would be much better, and a robustly protected active transportation lane. All of those inexpensive design changes contribute to saving lives. The only thing we don't support is recommendation two, because we know that Toronto police are systemically racist and significantly more likely to use violent force and even draw a gun on an unarmed person if that person is not white. Therefore, we don't think involving police for enforcement is any kind of a solution for public safety. It is simply far better 
more fair, more just, and less costly in every possible way to just build streets that are safe by design. So overall, we are pleased to see this motion, and we call on all members of the Toronto East York Community Council to delete recommendation two and vote in favour of this motion today and at the next City Council meeting. Um, and if someone would indulge me and ask me a quick question about the All Collision database, I can share slightly more information with you if you're interested. Thank you. Well, let's see. Are there any questions for the deputant? You know what? We're really tired. So um, maybe you can uh, circulate that to members of the committee. Okay. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your thoughts with us tonight. Uh, the last listed deputant I have is Arlene Desjardins. Hi, Arlene. Welcome. this motion today <laughs> and um, what I'm doing is part of my uh, deputation is I'm going to present a video uh, because I wanted to give a voice to the uh, coalition members and to residents in our community so I'm by way it's it's insane it scares me when there's a lot of cars and I go alone and I don't know if the cars are gonna stop me. we're at the bottom of the hill and the cars come down really quickly uh, we, we need wider sidewalks. The sidewalks on Avenue Road in some areas are a very, very serious problem. Extremely difficult. If you see a person pushing a carriage or a stroller or an elderly person on a walker, and as you know, we have a lot of elderly people in this area, including myself. The sidewalks along this stretch are a big concern due to the fact that they're very narrow. There are over 10,000 units that have been built or will be built in this neighborhood. Our sidewalks cannot accommodate the people that we have now. We need wider sidewalks and we need slower speeds on Avenue Road. My name is Albert Cole and um, one of the uh, members of the uh, coalition. You know, the city says this is an arterial road. Uh, we call it home. It's a place where our kids grow up and go to school and uh, it's where seniors go for, a, go for a walk. For the last eight years, the city has removed this lane of traffic. Eight years is a long time. Clearly, it hasn't been the end of traffic in our neighborhood. Removing lanes for sidewalks will certainly not be the end of traffic in this neighborhood as well. We don't accept that it's just an arterial road. It's a place where we live. It's our home. I'm Arlene Dejardin, and I'm a longtime resident of the Avenue and Davenport area. I'm also a member of the Avenue Road Safety Coalition. Data shows that this intersection at Avenue and Davenport has the second highest rate of collisions within 53 divisions. In one situation, a youngster who was who was hit by a car, thank heaven there, there, was, there was no serious damage done. It seems that we're always reactive instead of proactive. What I would like to see done now is to make these, this a walkable area. Don't wait for someone to be killed or seriously injured before we take action. <laughs> you know, this was a street built in the 50s. We're not in the 50s anymore. We have different values, different priorities. Wider sidewalks are definitely good for business. It's important for pedestrians to be able to walk, especially now with COVID. The sidewalks here are so thin that we're so close to the cars that you feel like the car is going to suck you right into the road. We have a park here in a community, and due to the fact that these narrow sidewalks exist, it really deters people from spending time on the streets. Wider sidewalks, I think, would naturally make the cars slow down. Um, they would feel it's a residential neighborhood, because it is. And people would feel more free to walk, have their strollers, uh, without feeling like they're going to be pitched into traffic if they make a wrong move. My name is Bhakti Mark Swami, and I've been a resident here on Avenue Road for 45 years and I've uh, witnessed a lot of serious accidents, such as an elderly lady, her car rammed right into our building. Good morning, my name is Rita Billerman. I'm the chair of the ARA, that's the Annex Residents Association. We have lobbied hard to seek improvements along this perilous stretch of road. That's why I am so pleased to be here today to call attention to this really important work. 
Well, we know that uh, Toronto has very quickly, literally overnight, installed uh, bikeways, for example, curbside uh, cafes. They've installed uh, as well queuing space in front of stores. Well, we, we, we know city can do this virtually overnight to use temporary materials such as cement curbs uh, to map out a space for safety, to map out a space uh, for a pedestrian. So we know that can be done overnight. Uh, we don't want another study. We know that, as we've said, uh, the only study that's needed is, well, your camera and uh, people just walking up and down the street to know that there's ample space for a wider sidewalk and the sidewalk is totally deficient uh, currently. The credits better be over in 11 seconds. <laughs> it will. Okay. Oh, no, they won't. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to have to ask you to stop there. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? No. Thank you for putting that together and sharing it with us and, and for being here tonight. Well, thank you as well. Okay. Are there any other members of the public who wish to make a deputation? I mean, that sounded better when the room was full. Um, no? Okay. So we'll bring it into committee. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Councillor Moyes? Um, is Avenue Road a, um, has, does it have a bus route? Or a transit route? Uh, is, so, so my question to staff, if there's a transit route and you want to reduce the uh, traffic lanes, don't you have to go through council for that? Through the speaker, yes. Um, I'm hopefully you're on, you can hear me okay. Um, yes, the Avenue Road does have a TTC route, so a decision by TEY would flow through to council for approval. Okay, thank you. Just confirming. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? I've lost Councillor Sachs' video. Can see her, I can't. Councillor Sachs, do you have any questions of staff? Yes? Okay. The floor is yours. I'm, I'm here. I've, I've asked my questions. I'm ready to I'm ready to go to speaking when you're ready. Okay. Are there any other questions? No? Councillor Sachs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, a thank you, first of all, to the Avenue Road Safety Coalition and everybody who contributed to that excellent Councilor video. Councillor Sachs, thank do you, you have a motion? Already. Yes, I do. Sorry, I should say that first. I have a motion. On behalf of my colleague, Councillor Matlow, I have a motion to extend, yes, uh, the area where we're requesting enforcement up to St. Clair. It's on the screen. Um, now, in addition to that, more generally, I did want to say thank you. This is, as I said in the motion, a situation where we've had uh, a real serious problem for pedestrians for 50 years since the sidewalks were slashed to make more room for cars. The Avenue Road Safety Coalition has been organizing faithfully for six years with strong neighborhood support, calling for two key things, slower speed limits and wider sidewalks. And over that entire period of time, absolutely nothing has been done to widen the sidewalks or, or slow the speeds. So. It is far, 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 far um, overdue time to now do whatever we can and to do it as quickly as we can. And I agree with everything that was said in the video. Are there any uh, questions of the mover? Does anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Uh, uh, hooray! There we are. Okay. Well done, A AV. Those guys, I don't know how they do it. I think they're some magical potion they've got. Um, okay, so why don't we take the amendment and the item as a package? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Next, I can't believe I have to say that. Next, item TE 4.70, update on Metrolinx's Ontario line construction within the Toronto and East York district. We have deputants, Rob Hatton. Thank wow you. Wow us, Rob. Thank you. 
And thank you for your endurance. I'm very impressed with the new crop of counselors and how much staying power they have. And I do appreciate this opportunity. Um, I didn't depute on the Ontario Place item, but there is a connection between that one and this one. Um, Councillor Sachs was um, asking about the importance of parking to the Ontario Place proposal. And I think, uh, I think the deputants did provide an answer. I think they said that the modal split was that there would only 10% of the expected attendees would be coming by car. 10%. So not really very critical at all or important if it's only 10%. But it is important that they find another way to get there. And presumably that's the Ontario line. And the Ontario line, unfortunately, is a $16 billion project that misses Ontario Place and lands instead at Exhibition Stadium, where the other transit is also landing, missing the opportunity to actually get people to Ontario Place. Imagine going to you know, Disney World and you're on the monorail and you can kind of see Disney World and they say, okay, everybody, get out and walk the rest of the way. That is what Ontario Place delivers. Like many people, I've heard about the cost estimates for this project and I am shocked. For an agency that was given responsibility for transit expansion in order to improve cost effectiveness and subsequently given every possible legal advantage, legislation, legislative advantage, Metrolink still seems unable to deliver without costing us a multiple of what other transit projects cost. It is also an overtly political organization. Its public consultations are widely criticized for being without substance. It pursues highly objectionable strategies, surviving court injunctions, without apparent regard for the impact on the citizenry. It is secretive about decisions and costs, and worst of all, it makes important design decisions that appear to defy logic and business sense, while it is protected by legislation prohibiting the host city from studying improvements to its plans. These are not the characteristics of a good public agency. In my neighborhood, Metrolinx is intent on pursuing an above ground alignment of the subway, citing the high cost of tunneling. We know the decision is inconsistent with the Ontario government's transit oriented communities legislation because unlike the tunneling option, it results in zero redevelopment opportunity at the Queen Street station and accordingly no opportunity to offset station costs with developer contributions. We also know the decision was made before major cost increases to the already excessively costly above ground requirement to replace six bridges in a 1.5 kilometer span. The decision was also made without due consideration, i.e. no costing analysis of the tunneling option that the city had previously concluded was the best approach. What organization would turn a blind eye to such information and refuse the request of its host city to provide a cost comparison? These concerns and more have led me to conclude that Metrolinx has abandoned its fiduciary duty to the public. It is spending or plans to spend on designs that have resulted in outrageously, an outrageously priced project in part due to its refusal to reasonably consider options that could save it money. Metrolinx is accountable only to the Minister of Transportation. Its board members are provincial appointees. The operating agreement with the city does not hold Metrolinx to account for design choices. So, my objective is to hold Metrolinx accountable to the citizens and taxpayers of Toronto and Ontario. And my intention, my plan, is to take Metrolinx to court and to prove it has breached its fiduciary duty and owes the public restitution or damages or corrective action. In this regard, I could use some help, your help, to help defray the cost or support the development of the court application. The city is uniquely positioned to help and frankly should have an interest in the outcome. So I'm here seeking your support. Could you please recommend the city support this initiative? Thank you.
Thank you. Right on five minutes. It's like you'd been here before. <laughs> uh, are there any questions of the deputy? No? Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Uh, the next deputy is Haley Morrison. Haley Morrison? Haley Morrison. And so, on that sad note, we complete the deputations we have this evening. At 10.01. Okay, are there any questions of staff? No? Questions of staff? No? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Councillor Malik. Um, I, I guess, um, in the interest of just efficiency, um, to ask staff, uh, we've been in conversation about how to continue to move forward with the requests that were referred back to TYCC. Are you able to give us an, an um, update about um, the approach that you've taken uh, to the pathways of the different uh, motions um, and uh, what we can anticipate? So through you, um, um, Mr. Chair, to, to the councillor, uh, We've uh, shared a document uh, with uh, Councillor Malik, um, and I'm not sure. Perhaps it should have been shared with the with the rest of the committee members. And what this uh, document does is it actually takes the uh, motions that were uh, presented during the uh, subcommittee and breaks them down and provides uh, um, uh, target dates for us to report back through to uh, the various um, committees. So, for example. Uh, one of the first report backs will be to the uh, next session of TYECC. Uh, we're also in communication with um, um, Councillor Malik's office as well to talk about how we can best approach uh, concluding all of these items and then getting them over to Metrolinx so that uh, we can get the appropriate answers from them and from government. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, th absolutely. That, that answers the question that this is in process and working closely together with you and your team, which we're very grateful for, to make sure that we can land on achieving the mandate that was laid out in the subcommittee around ensuring that um, the public has an opportunity to be heard um, as uh, as the, we know construction on the line is, is imminent and to be able to have clear recommendations that come through the subcommittee and TYCC uh, to council about our expectations around the implementation and construction of the Ontario line. Um, so really grateful to be working with you and uh, to be sharing that information with the subcommittee members so that we're moving this, this item forward. Okay, all right. Sorry, I, I, I gapped there. Um, anyone else wish to speak? No? Okay, all those in favor? Oh, oh sorry, what? Sorry. Oh, we all got. 10 o'clock, everything goes wrong. I do appreciate you guys hanging in, I really do. I bet you're happy that we didn't grill you for a long time though, right? You want being grilled? And fried and fillet. I'm sorry, I do have motions. Okay, it's late. Yeah. All right, so there is a motion. Yes. And I think as. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> as you suggested, it requires a whole lot of reports. Mistaken. Yeah. Uh, so um, there are just some adjustments. You'll you will have seen um, the motions that were coming forward okay. from Date. the subcommittee. Um, there were some adjustments to dates, and then there's also um, two motions that I'm bringing forward on behalf of Councillor Fletcher um, that are amendments to what you see in front of you. Is that, is that right? What, one motion is an amendment, and and there's another fresh fresh motion. Okay. I swear I'm taking all of this in. <laughs> If we can just have those up. Yeah. 
Okay, that's motion B. Yeah. City Council request, request, yeah, yeah. direct. Uh, and these motions have been shared with, okay. <laughs> with the tra transit executive right. director. Transit executive. They look good to me. Um, so why don't we take it all as one package? All those in favor, opposed if any, that carries. And uh, members, just like in keeping with the spirit of the day, it turns out I was wrong. There is another item with deputants. Yep. Uh, this is item 4.28, 1 Bloor Street West, noise exemption permit refusal appeal. Uh, we have two deputants listed. Diana Awad, is that you, Diana? Good evening, it's Dina Awad. Dina, I am so sorry. No problem, thank I can you. I know it's been a, a long day and I appreciate everybody's patience. Okay, Dina, you have five minutes. You can start as soon as you're ready. Just trying to hook up my computer. Okay, we'll just have some someone for me. Oh, there we go, okay, very good. Dive in. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. And once again, thanks for sticking around and for your patience and hearing me today. My name is Dina Awad. I'm a partner at Dentons Canada LLP, and I'm here on behalf of Mizrahi Development Group, The One Inc. Uh, this is an appeal application for a construction noise exemption permit submitted by uh, Mizrahi. We filed our submission with the clerk, and I understand that you've received and have reviewed our appeal package. I just want to highlight a few items to your attention. Uh, first, we understand that noise is an unfortunate part of downtown Toronto right now, especially near Young and Bloor where the development is located. In view of this reality, Mizrahi has sought to be a responsible builder that is doing everything possible to contain, mitigate, and shorten the intended length of the noise. In this regard, the key steps that are being taken are as follows monthly stakeholder meetings which are facilitated meetings with the community, targeted follow-up discussions with individuals as requested, senior project staff providing their personal cell phone numbers for residents who have any concerns to call them, and acting in response to any complaints or concerns. Mizrahi has hired a noise expert to monitor and provide continuous feedback on the noise, and, uh, and reactions are being taken if there are exceedances on the noise monitors. I've included some schematics that I will uh, come to in a moment, but it's important to remember that no noise may come from a number of locations off-site and appear to be coming from this location. Uh, further, Mizrahi is agreeable to reducing morning operations and to amending its request in accordance with the feedback received from Councillor Sachs for a 6.30 start. And Mizrahi has commissioned a noise engineer to look at options to reduce noise during normal hours from a concrete pump that uh, has been a, a cause for concern for the residents and is actually implementing the mitigating measures. Mizrahi does wish to work collaboratively with the city and with Councillor Sachs uh, and uh, wants to continue consulting and engaging with the community. It is in the interest of everybody involved for the exemption to be granted. And uh, the first uh, image that I'd like to take you through to try and illustrate is that as we build taller, less noise will be created from the project. This shows that as the development gets taller, the distance increases from the point of origin, which reduces noise both because of the distance and from the hard surfaces, which create a barrier. A sound barrier will interrupt the line of sight between the sound source, in this case, the construction, to attenuate the noise. And the greater the interruption, the greater the attenuation. So the one itself, the building itself, creates the attenuation. The higher it gets, the more of a sound barrier uh, it creates. And so there's a real interest in allowing it to get high enough to either meet or exceed the neighboring buildings, at which point the noise will be significantly lessened. The other uh, image that I thought might be helpful to share with you, and these are all images that have been created by uh, an expert sound engineer that's been hired to monitor uh, the situation are um, data from an average construction day on the site and data from an average weekend day where there was no construction on the site. And again, this is from the continuous monitoring that's taking place 24 seven on the site. And this, is, this just shows that the construction noise from an average construction day is actually 
are not significantly higher from the background ambient that's present at this intersection on a normal weekend. This is a very, very busy area of the city, lots of traffic and just very loud overall. The third image that I'd like to share with you is, um, is an image that was also developed by the sound engineer, which explains the uh, noise confusion that often happens at this site because of the, topograph the, the topography and the hard surfaces. There's at least four construction sites in the immediate vicinity, and this shows that if noise is coming from one construction uh, source, it tends to reflect and reverberate off of the other buildings and appear to the surrounding neighbors as if it is coming from the Mizrahi construction site when it is not. And once again, the sound engineer that has been hired has, has concluded that this area is especially prone to noise confusion. So respectfully, Mizrahi requests that this appeal be allowed and that the noise exemption permit be granted with the amended start time to address prior concerns by Councillor Sachs. Um, and, and as mentioned, the higher we build, the, the quicker we will get to attenuating the noise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant? I don't have counselors. Okay, I, seeing none, thank you I'm, very much. I'm here, do I'm you, here. Do you have a question of the deputant? No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also have listed John Rothwell. Not present, okay. Any other members of the public? Look, the room's empty. <laughs> I mean, congratulations, like you just one survivor. I, I've been here since 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. Um, okay, any questions of staff? No, to speak, Councillor Sachs? I have a motion you'll be delighted to know. The clerk has it. Here we are. So, um, We've had very detailed negotiations with the applicant um, after receiving a number, uh, well, a significant number of complaints from people in the immediate adjacent building uh, about noise. And so we have, as you saw, for a large part of the day, negotiated a set of much more stringent noise conditions for the next year, which include a later start time, restriction to electric equipment, um, um, additional noise attenuation measures to be applied to some of the existing equipment, uh, monitoring, uh, a, a number of activities that aren't allowed after 9 p.m. at night, uh, enclosure of certain activities on the tower, and the key thing being that the concrete pump and hopper, which has been the biggest source of disturbance for the neighbors, will now be properly enclosed, which frankly it should have been all along. And there will be a temporary enclosure within a week and a pro proper permanent enclosure within a month in accordance with a whole series of specifications developed by a noise consultant. Um, which has to have be specifically designed to have noise attenuation characteristics suitable for the most disturbing part of the sound from this pump, which is 400 hertz. So that's the motion, and uh, it should mean a significant improvement in the noise being uh, experienced by the immediate neighbors. Okay, any questions of the mover? Seeing none, does anyone else wish to speak? Is anyone else capable of speaking? Um, okay, so we'll uh, vote on Councillor Sachs' motion. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have two other items of business, no deputations on them though. Councillor Sachs, you also held item TE 4.45, 225 Brunswick Avenue encroachment agreement, sunken building, entrances and garbage storage boxes appeal. And if you didn't know that we did garbage storage boxes appeal, you have learned something today. Oh. I have a motion. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, well, there it is. Anyway, the motion is just uh, to make the garbage bin exposure, sorry, to make the garbage enclosures max clad to match the building, the developer has agreed. 
This is how you make a beautiful city. Okay, so we'll take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Councillor Sachs, you also held item TE 4.46, 31 Oxford Street, encroachment agreement, basement walkout appeal. Yeah, we, we've worked it out. I want to move the staff recommendation. On the staff recommendations, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Mr. Chair, you're amazing. Well, no, don't say that yet. Can I have a motion to reopen item TE 4.10? Councillor Sachs was moving it. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. Councillor Sachs, the floor is yours. Oh, I've lost your audio. Oh my God. Did Let's you... try that again. Ah. So, have you got me now? Yes. Okay, so uh, staff say that we needed to change the wording of condition eight. So there's a motion. Okay, thank you. This is the motion to make sure that this building, which isn't putting in parking, the people who move in there aren't entitled to get permit parking spots in the neighborhood. Uh, and, no, no, it's not that so, no, right, no, no, wrong one. Yeah, that is my motion. There is there. Hang I on, sent you. A, a, hang on. Yeah, hang no, just, we're working. Yeah. We're working. We have we're so better, close. Better wording for that. You can yeah. see the finish line. Yeah. <laughs> you can almost touch it. Okay, here we come. No, no, it's cool. Doing great. New recommendation eight. Thank okay. you. Good, I see it. I understand it. So uh, we'll just take it all as a package. All those in favor, oppose, that carries. I think that means we're on to the bills. We are on to the bills. them up I'll just quickly read it oh you've brought your daughter to like she's trying to figure out what stupid job does my mom do for a living okay I move that bills 317 to 349 and 351 to 353 prepared for the April 12 2023 meeting four of the Toronto East York Community Council be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 2269 of the City of Toronto Act 2006, how does that work when we don't have a mayor? They just sit there? Oh, they automatically go after a couple days. Okay, because the non-mayor didn't do anything. Just bakes your noodle. Okay, all those in favor, oppose that carries. And I think we have another one. I move that confirmatory bills to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Toronto East York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting four on April 12, 2023, be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226.9, can't wait for that to be removed from law, of the City of Toronto Act 2006. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Members, we have no business left. You may go about your lives. Thank you, Councillor Sachs. Thank you.